defeated Ikrima, Rifa'a divorced his wife, whereupon Abdul Rahman bin as Zubayr al Khurazi married her. Aisha said that the lady came wearing a green veil and complained to her, Aisha, of her husband and showed her a green spot on her skin caused by the beating. It was the habit of ladies to support each other. So when Allah's apostle came, Aisha said, I have not seen any woman suffering as much as the believing women. Look, her skin is greener than her clothes, referring to the bruise. When Abdul Rahman heard that his wife had gone to the Prophet, he came with his two sons from another wife. And she said, by Allah, I have done no wrong to him, but he is impotent and is as useless to me as this, holding and showing the fringe of her garment. Abdul Rahman said, by Allah, O oh, oh Allah's Apostle, she has told a lie. I am very strong and can satisfy her, but she is disobedient and wants to go back to Rifa'a. Allah's Apostle said to her, if that is your intention, then know that it is unlawful for you to remarry Rifa'a unless Abdul Rahman has had any sexual intercourse with you. Then the Prophet saw two boys with Abdul Rahman and, and asked him, are these your sons? On that, Abdul Rahman said, yes. The Prophet said, you claim what you claim, i.e. that he is impotent, but by Allah, these boys resemble him as a crow resembles a crow. So how can you claim that Muhammad is the best moral example to a humankind when he acted like this? Couldn't you or I both come up with a better moral example than this, like telling men not to hit their wives? This uh, story shows that when a woman had been severely beaten by her husband and went before the Prophet, the only person Muhammad told off was the wife for saying that the husband was impotent. So let's get to number seven. This is number seven in my uh, top 10 worst and most unjust and immoral things that Muhammad ever did. Number seven, Muhammad let a murderer go unpunished. There was a man who owned a slave and he had sex with her and that slave had given him birth to his children, but was still a slave. This is called an umwalad. Uh, th this sounds like uh, this Islamic society had the ideal rules for humans to live in, doesn't it? But she, he claims that she used to defame and insult Muhammad, so he murdered her. It says in uh, Sunan Abu Dawood, uh, Book 40, Hadith 11, and in uh, Sunan An Nasai, Book 37, Hadith 105, this is, by the way, in the Arabic numbering system, not the English numbering system. And both of these uh, hadith transmissions are uh, rated Sahih by Al Albani and Dari Salam. Narrated Abdullah ibn Abbas, a blind man had a slave mother who used to abuse the Prophet and disparage him. He forbade her, but she did not stop. He rebuked her, but she did not give up her habit. One night, she began to slander the Prophet and abuse him. So he took a dagger, placed it on her belly, uh, pressed it, and killed her. A child who was between her legs was smeared with the blood that was there. When the morning came, the Prophet was informed about it. He assembled the people and said, I adjure by Allah, the man who has done this action, and I adjure him by my right that he should stand up. Jumping over the necks of the people and trembling, the man stood up. He sat before the Prophet and said, Messenger of Allah, I am her master. She used to abuse you and disparage you. I forbade her, but she did not stop. And I rebuked her, but she did not abandon her habit. I have two sons like pearls from her, and she was my companion. Last night she began to abuse and disparage you. So I took a dagger, put it on her belly, and pressed it till I killed her. Therefore the Prophet said, O be witness, no retaliation is payable for her blood. And in another chain it says, I bear witness that her blood is permissible. So here is Muhammad, and he has found a, a woman has been murdered. A man admits to it, and this man gives the reason that she used to insult him. And Muhammad does not punish him for the murder at all. Is this meant to be the most just, uh, a man who lets a murderer go totally unpunished? Or is this the actions of a morally compromised narcissist? How narcissistic do you have to be to believe that someone deserves to die for insulting you? Number six, murdering a girl for insulting him. There are many examples of Muhammad murdering and ordering assassinations of people who insulted him or, comp or composed satirical poetry about him or denied his prophethood. And this can be found in many classical biographies of Muhammad written by Muslim historians. But we'll go through one in particular. This is uh, Fartana, 
one of the two dancing slave girls, slave girls owned by Abd al Uzza bin Katal, who used to sing satirical songs about Muhammad. It says in the um, authentic tradition in Sunan Abu Dawood, uh, Book 15, Hadith 207, narrated Sa'ad, on the day when Mecca was conquered, the Messenger of Allah gave protection to the people except four men and two women. And he named them. Ibn Abi Sa'ar was one of them. It goes on to describe what happened to Ibn Abi Sa'ar. And the same uh, is uh, reported in the uh, Hassan uh, Hadith, which means the uh, good Hadith, uh, Sunan An Nasai, Book 37, Hadith 102. It was narrated from Masud bin Sa'ad that his father said, uh, on the day of the conquest of Mecca, the Messenger of Allah granted amnesty to the people, except four men and two women. He said, kill them, even if you find them clinging to the covers of the Kaaba. This is found in the biography of Muhammad, Al Sira al Nabawiya, by Ibn Kathir, who's a student of Ibn Taymiyyah. Uh, it, um, he compiled it from Ibn Ishaq Sira, but it, it is said that he only included the uh, reports which had good chains. It says, it says, uh, uh, in, in this, this says in uh, page 403 of, uh, uh, volume, four of, of, our Sir, of volume 3 of our Sira al Nabawiya. He had two female singers, Fartana and a friend, who would sing songs mocking the Messenger of Allah and the Muslims. This is why the Messenger of God condemned him and the two singers to death. Then it goes on to say, one of his women singers was killed while the other was granted clemency. And yes, we can find many other reports of Mus from Muslim historical sources saying that Muhammad ordered assassinations and killings, some of whom had already had only merely insulted him and denied his claims of prophethood. Number five, practicing torture. There are various examples of this, of Muhammad practicing torture. Stoning, for example, is the Islamic punishment for adultery committed by married people. Now, that itself is a form of torture. You're killing someone in a deliberately slow and painful way by hitting them with many rocks. It's recorded in a um, in a Termidi, uh, Jamiat Termidi, Book 17, Hadith 12, a Sahih Hadith. Umar bin Al Khattab said, "Verily, Allah sent Muhammad with the truth, and He revealed the book to him. Among what was revealed to him was the ayah of stoning. So the Messenger of Allah stoned, and we stoned after him." So. Uh, there's other examples though, like the report that Muhammad order a fire be lit underneath Kanana, the treasurer of the Banu Nadir tribe. Uh, no, sorry, I'm not the Banu Nadir tribe. The, uh, the, the, yeah, the Banu Nadir tribe of Kabar, um, Banu Nadir, in order to find where he had hid the treasure. And he did not reveal it, so he was killed. Even Ishak's biography of Muhammad, page 515 says, Kanana al-Rabi, who had the custody of the treasure of Banu Nadir, was brought to the apostle who asked him about it. He denied that he knew where it was, and a Jew came to the apostle and said that he had seen Kanana going around a certain ruin every morning early. When the apostle said to Kanana, do you know that if we find you have it, I shall kill you? He said, yes. The apostle gave orders that the ruin was to be excavated and some treasure was found. When he was asked about the rest, he refused to produce it. So the apostle gave orders to Al Zubayr al Awam, torture him until you extract what he has. So he kindled a fire with flint and steel on his chest until he was nearly dead. Then the apostle delivered him to Muhammad bin Maslama and he struck off his head in revenge for his brother Mahmud. While at Tabari's History of Prophets and Kings, says in volume 8, page 122, the Prophet gave orders concerning Kanana to Zabir, saying, torture him until you root out and extract what he has. So Zubair kindled a fire on Kanana's chest, twirling it with his fire stick until Kanana was near death. Then the messenger gave him to Maslama, who beheaded him. So uh, number four, married and had sex with a nine-year-old. So it says in a uh, kind of um, the book Sahih Muslim, uh, book 16, Hadith 83, uh, with the Arabic numbering system, Aisha, Allah be, be pleased with her, reported that Allah's apostle married her when she was seven years old, and he was taken to his house as a bride when she was nine, and her dolls were with her. 
And when he, the Holy Prophet, died, she was 18 years old. Another narration in Sahih Bukhari, book 67, Hadith 69, says, narrated Aisha that the Prophet married me when I was six years old and that he consummated my marriage when I was nine years old. And there are many other hadith like this, which you can see just by going onto sunnah.com and searching Aisha, Muhammad, uh, Aisha married or Aisha consummated. There aren't any hadith that state alternatively that Muhammad married her when she was, say, 15. But people have constructed alternative explanations about her. Um, for example, it being reported that she was at a battle and at this battle it was normally the uh, custom that children aren't present at battles and this battle happened at a certain year, so working backwards, they, they, you have these kinds of explanations. However, these explanations seem more tenuous to me. There's also the idea that many of the reports um, about Muhammad consummating the marriage of Aisha come through Aisha's son alone, and that therefore this makes the report, all of the reports suspicious. However, I find the idea of conspiracy doubtful, since there are also reports that Muhammad's uh, companions marrying children, uh, there are also reports about Muhammad's companions marrying children in similar circumstances. For example, uh, there's a story about um Umar marrying Ali's daughter, and it says, Umar asked Ali for the hand of his daughter, Umm Kulthum, in marriage, and Ali replied that she has not yet attained the age of maturity, and Umar replied, by Allah, this is not true. You do not want her, want her to marry me. If she is underage, send her to me. Thus Ali gave his daughter Umm Kulthum a dress and asked her to go to Umar and tell him what her father wants to know and tell her that the father wants him to know what the dress is for. When she came to Umar and gave him the message, he grabbed her hand and forcibly pulled her towards him. Umm Kulthum asked him to leave her hand, which Umar did, and said, You are a very well-mannered lady with great morals. Go and tell your father that you are very pretty and you are not what he said of you. With that, Ali married Umm Kulthum to Umar, and that's from Tariq Kamiz, Volume 2, page 384. And also, Zakir al-Akbar, page 168. There's also reports about Ali bin Ali Ta... Abi, no, sorry. There's also reports about, um, from Awa ibn Zubayr, that Zubayr, may uh, Allah be pleased with, pleased with him, married his daughter when she was very young. And this is reported by Saeed ibn Mansur in his Sunnah and in Ibn Abi Shaiba in Al Masanat with a uh, Sahi chain of narration. Al Shafi, the Muslim jurist, said in his book of Al Um, many companions of the Prophet uh, married their daughters while they were still young. So this makes the report that uh, Ma Muhammad married a nine year old more credible. Furthermore, the Quran seems to sanction child marriage. In Quran uh, chapter 65 verse 4, where it talks about how long should the gap be after divorce to confirm that a girl is not pregnant before she can get married again to someone else, um, it says in chapter 65 verse 4, and those who no longer expect menstruation amongst your women, if you doubt, then their period is three months. And also for those who have not menstruated, um, so some say that this refers to that not menstruated refers to adult women who have a medical complication so that they can they've never had a period but reports about the circumstances of revelation of this verse indicate that it was actually about uh, the plain meaning of uh, girls who've not yet had their periods because they're too young ibn kathir in his uh, famous commentary of the quran says that um, he gives the report that it is reported from Ubay bin Kab that he said, O oh Allah's Messenger, some women were not mentioned in the Quran, the young, the old and the pregnant. Allah the exalted and most honoured sent down this ayah. And there's another report from Ibn Abi Hatim saying Ubay bin Kab who said, O uh, oh Allah's Messenger, when the ayah in Surat al-Baqarah was revealed, described prescribing the idda of divorce, the waiting period of divorce, some people in Medina said, but there are still some people whose idda has not been mentioned in the Quran. There are the young, the old, whose menstruation is discontinued, and the pregnant. Later on, this ayah was revealed. So reports uh, from the historical reports indicate that this uh, verse saying that uh, the, div the divorce period should be three months for those who have not had their period, is, is indicating children. 
Quran chapter 33 verse 49 says, O you who have believed, when you marry believing women and then divorce them, before you have touched them, then there is not for you any waiting periods to count concerning them. Meaning, this verse means that there is only a need for a waiting period if you've had sex with your wife, not if you've simply been betrothed. Which means that chapter 65, 4, when it states that the waiting period for girls who have not yet menstruated is, uh, when it gives that waiting period, it's tacitly giving permission for men to have sex with prepubescent brides in Islam. And this is what the orthodox Sunni Islamic and also Shia Islamic law says. So th this is another kind of moral failing of Muhammad, a poor moral teaching and a poor moral example. My number three is attacking people who never attacked him simply because they did not accept his religion. Muslims are generally told about Muhammad's life that he was persecuted and only fought back against the Meccans who persecuted him and chased him out the city and confiscated his wealth. And that this is all the war that was conducted during Muhammad's life. But this leaves out that the last couple of years of his life, after Muhammad has conquered Mecca, where he called upon the whole of Arabia to accept him as a prophet and waged war against people who had never attacked him or the Muslims, simply because they did not respond to the call of Islam. There are numerous, numerous examples of this that are plainly recorded in the early historical biographies of Muhammad, like Ibn Sa'd's Kitab al-Tabakat al-Kabir, or at Tabari's Histories of Prophets and Kings, or Ibn Kathir's al sirah al Nabawiya, or even Safiya Rahman's Sealed Nectar, which is a modern uh, Muslim historian's biography, as well as the traditions rated as authentic in the likes of Bukhari and Muslim. So you might, we're going to get into those in a minute. You might object, but the Quran has verses like uh, Quran uh, 68, Quran chapter 60 verse 8, or Quran chapter 2 verse 190, which um, say not to, not to fight non-Muslims if they do not fight you. But it also has verses like uh, uh, chapter 9 verse 29, chapter 9 verse 5, chapter 9 verse 123, and chapter 8 uh, verse 39 which all call for waging war against non-Muslims on the basis of their religious belief. These two groups of verses are plainly contradictory. The Quran is a creation of Muhammad, and Muhammad contradicted himself. It's wrong to expect consistency from the Quran since Muhammad changed his mind multiple times. The unfortunate thing for us is that the last chapters delivered were the ones where Muhammad felt like waging war in order to spread his religion and make it dominant. So the fact that early in Muhammad's life, he at times called for peaceful coexistence, does not help us with the fact that the final marching orders he left Muslims with called for war. If you want to try and understand or resolve this contradiction, what choice do you have but to look at the evidence of his life? And the evidence of his life is that latterly, he waged war against people who had never attacked him in order to spread his religion. For example, there was a group of worshippers of an idol called Dul Kalasa, whom Muhammad had invited to Islam, and they declined, so Muhammad sent men to destroy their place of worship, which resulted in a massacre. This is recorded in Sahih Bukhari, Book 63, Hadith 49. Jaria bin Abdullah narrated, there was a house called Dul Kalasa in the pre-Islamic period, and it was also called al Kaaba al Yaminiya or al Kaaba al Shamiya. Allah's messenger said to me, Will you relieve me from Dul Kalasa? So I left with 150 cavalrymen from the tribe of Ahmas, and then we destroyed it and killed whomever we found there. Then we came to the Prophet and informed him about it. He invoked good upon us and upon the tribe of Ahmas. There is absolutely no recorded evidence that these worshippers have attacked the Muslims. In fact, when you search the Hadith body, the Hadith corpus, for such evidence, all you will find is that they had previously been invited and declined peacefully. And this is found, for example, in uh, Sahih al-Bukhari, Book 92, Hadith 63, narrated Abu Huraira. Allah's Messenger said, the hour will not be established till the buttocks of the women of the tribe of Daus move while going round Dul Kalasa. And then, so we know that one of the tribes that worshipped at, that, at Dul Kalasa was uh, the, 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 the tribe of Daus. Then it says in Sahih Bukhari, 
book 56, Hadith 150, narrated to Abu Huraira, to fail bin Amr ad Dulsi and his companions came to the Prophet and said to Allah's Messenger, O Allah's Messenger, the people of the tribe of Daos disobeyed and refused to follow you, so invoke Allah against them. The Prophet said, the tribe of Daos, oh no, then the people rather said, the tribe of Daos is ruined. But the Prophet said, O Allah, give guidance to the people of Daos and let them embrace Islam. If these, the, so here it is, like uh, some people invited the tribe of Daos to worship Allah and they simply declined. If these worshippers had attacked the Muslims, then it would have been recorded. This is just one incident of many, which you will read if you actually look at Muhammad's life at the end, instead of only being told about it up until the conquest of Mecca, and then being told that the rest of Arabia simply instantly, voluntarily became Muslim, and then Muhammad died. Another, uh, you know, evidence of this is recorded in Sahih Bukhari Book 2, Hadith 18, narrated Ibn Umar, Allah's Messenger said, I have been commanded to fight against the people until they testify that none has the right to be worshipped but Allah and that Allah is Muhammad and that Muhammad is Allah's messenger. So this is already has a plainly uh, warfare against people of other religions until they accept Islam message. But we get even more crystal clear historical context about this report from the biographies like Ibn Kathir's Al Sira Al Nabawiya on pages 133 to 135, and I'll read those out. Year 10 AH uh, after Hijra, on the, mes the dispatch by the Messenger of Allah of Khalid bin Walid, Ibn Ishaq stated the Messenger of, Go of God sent forth Khalid bin Walid um, to Banu Al Harif bin Kab in Najran. He ordered him to invite them to Islam for three days before attacking them. If they did not respond positively, he was to accept them. And if they did not, he was to attack them. And this continues saying that Muhammad, that Khalid did exactly that. You might tell yourself, oh, but the people of Najran must have attacked the Muslims somehow. But if the people of Najran attacked the Muslims, why would Walid be sent to give them three days to convert before attacking them? Perfect. Other times when non-Muslims attacked the Muslims, Muhammad retaliated straight away. So this would not make sense as behavior towards people who attacked you, sending a delegation asking them to convert and then they'll be safe. In fact, when you read the history of Muhammad, the answer of his previous interactions with the people of Najran is given. As it says on page 71 of Ibn Kathir's Al Sira Al Nabawiya, uh, Volume 4, and the previous reference was from Volume 4 as well, that a delegation of Christians from Najran came to visit him and that they debated him, and it was concluded peacefully that e with each of them swearing to God that they are telling the truth and to strike them down if they are lying, and then they left. So, this shows that the previous record with the people of Najran was peaceful, but still, because they did not accept Islam, Muhammad latterly ordered that Khalid bin Walid visit them and give them an ultimatum that they had to convert to Islam or else they'll be fought. There are many other examples that can be looked at of Muhammad ordering people be attacked who had never attacked the Muslims. Like, for example, the people of the city of Jurash, which is reported in page 88 of volume 9, of At Tabri's history. Kind of, uh, Abdullah al Azdi came to the Messenger of God with the deputation from al Azd. They embraced Islam and became good Muslims. The Messenger of God invested him with authority over those of his people who had embraced Islam, and he ordered him to fight the polytheists uh, from the tribes of the Yemen who were amongst them. Surad bin Abdullah then left with an army by the messenger of God's command and alighted at Jurash, which at the time was a closed city inhabited by Yemeni tribes of Katham. Uh, Katham had sought refuge with them and when they heard that the Muslims were marching they shut themselves in it. The Muslims besieged them for about a month the tribes refrained from coming out of the city. Surad withdrew for them appearing to return 
When he was near a mountain called Kaz Kashar, the inhabitants of Jurash, thinking that he had fled from them, came out in pursuit of him. When they overtook him, he turned on them and inflicted a heavy loss on them. The, but while this was happening, it says, the people of Jurash had sent two of their own men to the messenger of God while he was in Medina to explore and see what was taking place. One evening after the afternoon prayer, while they were with the messenger of God, he inquired in which country uh, Shakar was. And the two men from Jurash got up and replied, O messenger of God, um, there is a mountain in our country called Kashar, and the people of Jurash called it likewise. And they said, What is the news of it, O messenger of God? He replied, Camels brought for sacrifices to the God at Mecca have been slaughtered there now. Then the two met with Abu Bakr and Uthman, who said to them, Woe unto you! The messenger of God has just now announced to you the death of your people. Now go to him and ask to pray to God to remove this affliction from your people. There is overwhelming evidence that Muhammad attacked and conquered people who had never attacked him simply because they were not Muslim and did not convert to his religion. And this is crystal clear to anyone who reads his early biographies or even modern historians biographies like Safiyah of Rahman's The Sealed Nectar. How would you like it if some Mormons or some Buddhists rolled up to you and said, hey, if you accept Buddhism, you'll be safe or kind of um, accept uh, that um, Buddhism is the true religion of God or I've been commanded to fight you. And then how would you like it if you declined and then they attacked you and destroyed your place of worship? You would not like it done to you. So why would Muhammad, so why did Muhammad do it to others and order his followers to do it? Shouldn't you treat others the way that you would like to be treated? I think any normal person can plainly see that it's wrong to attack people just because they won't convert to your religion. And yet there is overwhelming evidence that Muhammad did just that. Number two, practicing war rape and slavery. Muhammad enslaved women and these women were raped just like how thousands or just like how Pakistani soldiers raped tens or hundreds of thousands of Bengali women during the 1971 East Pakistan Bangladesh Civil War. Just like how Serbian soldiers raped Bosnian women in the Yugoslav Wars. Muhammad and his companions would raid villages during war, kill the men, kidnap and enslave the women whose husbands and fathers they had just killed and rape them. And here's the evidence for that. In a Sahih Muslim, Book 16, Hadith 147, it says, Abu Sama said to Abu Sa'id al Qudri, O oh Abu Sa'id, did you hear Allah's Messenger mes mentioning Al Azul? Al Azul means uh, pull out sex, having sex without ejaculating inside. He said yes and added, We went out with Allah's Messenger on the expedition to the Banu Mustalik and took captive some excellent Arab women, and we desired them, for we were suffering from the absence of our wives. But at the same time, we also desired ransom for them. So we decided to have sexual intercourse with them, but by observing Azul, withdrawing the male sexual organ before emission of semen to avoid conception. That's in a parenthesis. But we said, we are doing an act whereas Allah's messenger is amongst us. Why not ask him? So we asked Allah's messenger and he said, it does not matter if you do not do it, for every soul that is to be born up to the day of resurrection will be born. Some deluded people might claim that this wasn't rape and that these kidnapped, enslaved women whom Muhammad had just given permission to his men to have pull out sex with, would have wanted to have sex with the men who had just violently abducted them and killed their family members. This is clearly self-deluding denial. Would you want to have sex with men who had just kidnapped you and killed the men of your tribe and families? What about your mother or your sister or your daughter? Would they want that in that situation? Not only that, is it moral of Muhammad to tell these married men that they can have sex with people other than their wives? No, it isn't. You might tell yourself that this isn't in the Quran, but slavery is in the Quran. Chapter 23, verses 1 to 6, 1 to 6, Muhammad says that 
There's nothing wrong with a married Muslim having sex with his slave. It says in the Quran, uh, I'm going to quote the Quran now, Certainly will the believers have succeeded. They who guard their private parts, except from their wives, or those their right hands possess. For indeed they will not be blamed. So Muhammad t is telling Muslims that they're allowed to own slaves and have sex with them while married. Is this the ideal moral example? Sometimes Muslims say things like, Islamic morality, morality is so much better than this decadent, liberal Western world. Look at how promiscuous they are having sex before marriage. Yet their own religion says that a Muslim can be married and then own as many slaves as they want and have sex with all of them. Such incredible lack of self-awareness. There are responses like, Muhammad said to free the slaves. But what good is that when you're also taking new slaves from men and women and children whenever you go to war? Like it says in the Quran, chapter 8, verse 69, So enjoy what you have taken of war booty as being lawful and good, and fear Allah. Indeed, Allah is forgiving and merciful. The war booty here includes slaves, spoils of war, in, and also, you know, uh, goats, camels, uh, weapons, money, typical spoils of war. But slaves were included. They are the war booty. Furthermore, you say that Muhammad advised freeing slaves, but he also advised that it is his better to give slaves to your family members than to free them. And this is recorded in uh, the Book of uh, Traditions, Sahih Bukhari, Book 51, Hadith 28. Narrated Maimuna, the wife of the Prophet, that she manumitted her slave girl, and the Prophet said to her, you would have got more reward if you had given the slave girl to one of your maternal uncles. So how is any of this the ideal moral example to follow? Is the system that says nothing, there's nothing wrong with owning slaves, whose founder and his companions took civilians as slaves whenever they went to war, the ideal moral example to follow? Think of all the human misery that slavery has caused. Don't just make invalid excuses like, oh, but only if only they had been true Islamic slavery, then it would have been nice. Any system that allows humans to own other human beings as property and deny their freedom is going to lead to unjust abuses. The Western world started trying to abolish slavery in the late 1700s and exerted international pressure on other countries to ban the slave trade and abolish slavery themselves. The Ottoman Empire started following suit later, in the 1830s, when the Sultan issued a firman declaring all white slaves be free. And then slavery was properly abolished in the Ottoman Empire around the 1850s or 60s. However, however, within the resulting countries after the Ottoman Empire broke up, slavery was not banned until much later. Slavery was legal in Saudi Arabia until 1962. It was legal in nine, until 1952 in Qatar, 1949 in Kuwait, 1922 in Persia. Responsibility for this evil being allowed to continue to exist for so long must rest with Muhammad claiming that God is telling him that there is no blame on one who owns slaves and has sex with them. We can see the fruits of his example. And there are many other reports of Muhammad selling, buying and trading slaves that you can find and you can look them up. Um, I, I, I'm running short on time so I'll tell you to Google that one and look it up in Sahih Hadith books, authentic Hadith reports. So finally, uh, number one, the, the, the worst thing I think that Muhammad ever did, um, killing 600 prisoners of war and enslaving all women and children of the Banu Kareza Jews. So let's round off with a little war crime, an example of group punishment. A group of Jews from the Banu Kareza had a treaty with Muhammad, but reported to have attacked him. So Muhammad attacked them back and captured their whole tribe. And then it, sa and it says in Sahih Muslim, Book 32, Hadith 77, it has been narrated on the authority of Abu Sayyid al-Khudri, who said, the people of Khoreza surrendered, accepting the decision of Sa'd bin Mu'ad about them. Accordingly, the messenger of Allah sent for Sa'd, who approached him riding a donkey. When he approached the mosque, the messenger of Allah said to the Ansar, stand up to, the to receive your chieftain. Then he said to Sa'd, 
these people have surrendered, accepting your decision. He, Saad, said, you will kill their fighters and capture their women and children. Hearing this, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, you have adjudged by the command of God. And, so, and this is a hadith, and so it reports that Muhammad ordered some 600 captured prisoners to be executed and all the women and children to be enslaved. Even though only the elders and the fighting uh, leaders of the Banu Quraiza bear any responsibility for deciding to attack, the, uh, to attack Muhammad, but instead group punishment was inflicted on the whole tribe. Similar to how a dictator would inflict group punishment on, you know, if a small group commits some crime, you inflict it on the whole group. A survivor of this event reports in a Sahih um, authentic rated tradition in Sunan Abu Dawood, Book 40, Hadith 54, rated Sahih, narrated Atiyah al Qurezi. I was among the captives of Banu Qurezi. They, the companions, examined us, and those who had begun to grow hair, meaning pubic hair, were killed and those who had not were not killed. I was among those who had not grown hair." And so this is reporting again that Muhammad, well, let, 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 so I'm getting ahead of myself. This event is also recorded in all the biographies of Muhammad that I've mentioned before, like uh, Ibn Ishaq's uh, you know, um, biography of Muhammad, Jariyah at Tabari's uh, history of um, prophets and kings, uh, Ibn Sa'd's Kitab al-Tabakat al-Kabir. Imagine that, executing boys 13 or 14 years old who had only just started growing pubic hair because their tribe elders had ordered them to attack the Muslims. Why did Muhammad sanction this injustice? So that's my top 10. Uh, look into the, my claims yourselves directly from the books of traditions like Al-Bukhari and Muslim and others, as well as the early Muslim biographies like the history of Tabari or Ibn Kathir's Al-Sirah Al-Nabawiyah. How can this man be the ideal moral example if any of these things are true about him. And the evidence strongly suggests that all these things are true. Uh, so anyway, that's my presentation on uh, the top 10 worst things that Muhammad ever did.